All right, welcome back, everyone. I am now going to turn over the presentation to my spectacular darn colleagues, Kathleen and Georgia, who are going to finish our conference with a Q&A session. So addressing the questions that you submitted on the online form, on the Zoom Q&A, throughout this presentation. And yes, so please proceed. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carolyn, um, and for being the MC for today. It was nice to take a little bit of a backseat um, compared to yesterday. Um, so this is our very last event for our um, DARN conference, the very first DARN conference, and we think maybe the very first conference on teaching about disability and psychology. Um, so we got a lot of questions that were asked both during um, the various talks that sometimes we didn't get to answer, um, and then also ones that were submitted through our anonymous Google forum. So um, Georgia and I have a list here of things that we'd like to address. Um, but first, I want to take a moment to um, for each of us to introduce ourselves and um, just reflect a bit on the, what I think, uh, biasly perhaps, was an amazing conference. Um, so I'm Dr. Kathleen Bogart. I'm an associate professor of psychology at Oregon State University, and my research and teaching and scholarship focuses on ableism. Um, and I am uh, the co-leader of DARN. Um, and I do a visual description for you. I have wavy auburn hair. I have some big old bright red glasses that I have a lot of fun with. Um, and I have a, um, an orange patterned shirt. And I have a virtual background showing the disability pride flag. Um, and for those of you who might not be super familiar with the flag, um, it is a diagonal set of lines um, that are in kind of muted rainbow colors. And I'll tell a bit about the significance of the flag. So those different colors represent the kind of different types of disability or the different dimensions of disability. Um, um, and the diagonal nature of the lines indicates how people with disabilities have to skirt around barriers, um, cut across and navigate um, a world that was not built for us. Um, so Georgia, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Georgia Pena-Cararioglu. I use she, her pronouns, um, giving some time. I have a big name, thank you. <laughs> um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a clinical psychology student, doctoral student at the new school uh, for social research. I'm in my first year. I'm doing research around facial differences and uh, experiences of disabled students uh, in fashion programs right now. Um, I'm a member of DARN since quite the beginning, not on the founding members, but since quite the beginning, it is a great experience so far to be a student at the same time having support of uh, disabled people and allies who are already in positions of power within academia and outside academia. And it's great to, and empowering to me. Uh, so I'm very excited about this conference specifically. Um, Regarding my visual description, uh, I am a white woman. I have short curly hair. I um, I have uh, circle glasses, um, and you might see you might see me waving my hands a lot. I'm doing that, and one of my hands it has a limb difference, so you might notice that. Um, and I am in in my office right now, so I have like a small plant and my favorite artwork in the behind. Um, and so far, it seems like an excited conference. Um, my favorite part was, I think, the the questions after every speaker, because we would see mostly what uh, attendees would like to know, um, and especially as, um, and especially, um, how can I say it? Um, um, 
intersectional related questions, but also personal and experience oriented questions. So we can see the diverse within our community and within attendees too. Um, so Kathleen, I don't know, like if you would like to share about your favorite moments so far. We cannot hear you, you're muted. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and, and Georgia, you reminded me, I forgot a very crucial part of my, well, two very crucial parts of my identity and visual description. That is, I am a white woman, a cis woman, and I have a facial difference, which is quite obvious to um, anyone who is able to see me. Um, I have facial paralysis from a condition called Mobius syndrome. Um, so both Georgia and I identify as people with facial differences, and um, I, I think this is interesting um, to, to, to have reflected on this panel. Um, and, and just to give everyone a little background about why we're on this panel today is um, we, uh, when we submitted our uh, grant applications to fund this set of conferences, um, we had a whole committee of people from DARN um, who were involved in the planning and um, writing of the grant. So we tried to have everybody who was involved in the DARN teaching conference and involved in the committee um, to have a, uh, a speaking role during our conference. Um, and Georgia and I have actually been um, collaborating and kind of serving as mentor and mentee for a long time. So it's super fun to be on this panel with you. Um, you know, I was thinking about my favorite parts of the conference and I had kind of a whole list of notes. And then um, the last panel right before ours just blew that all out of the water. Um, the intersectionality panel really um, to me was um, so important and so nuanced. Um, we really gathered, a, I'm very excited about the panel that we gathered. Um, you know, just kind of reflecting on some of the comments there, um, I really kind of uh, resonated with what Katie Wong said about um, how, uh, well, and others said this as well, how intersectionality research has often kind of focused on um, gender and race uh, and, you know, maybe sexual orientation, um, but, including disability in that uh, is, is relatively new. So we can actually um, draw on the strengths of this existing intersectionality research um, and get them, you know, include our colleagues who are doing this type of work um, and uh, encourage them to include disability in there, right? Because there are these wonderful frameworks that, they, that exist. Um, there's some wonderful research paradigms like participatory action research. Um, and when we add disability into there, certainly we will have um, nuances and added value um, and all sorts of new information, but we don't have to start from scratch. And um, I'll also echo the call for allies to play a really important role here. This should not all be on the backs of people um, with these minoritized backgrounds, and especially these multiple minoritized backgrounds. Um, there's actually a nice literature on allyship and um, research on allyship, not specific to disability, but um, for all sorts of minoritized groups. And um, it uh, finds that allies can actually be um, more influential. Um, and, and I have feelings about this, but they can actually be more influential than the um, people who are minoritized themselves in speaking up about inequities. Um, so there are reasons for that, which honestly kind of gross me out, but the reasons are that, you know, allies have a bit more privilege in, um, in our systems. And so they would be more like, likely to be listened to and be influential. Um, the, the other, uh, another factor going on is that, um, other people may perceive allies as, having an outside role and not having as much of a stake in the game, not being as biased, right? Um, so 
I mentioned that this kind of grosses me out, right? Because this shows that um, people with these minoritized backgrounds do not have as much power um, to speak out to um, to the dominant culture. Um, so that is very unfortunate, but it does speak to the important role of allies and the benefit of not having to put all of this on our own backs. Um, so I, I, I'm just kind of still thinking about that intersectionality panel and we'll be processing it for a long time. Um, so now let's um, transition into some of the questions that were asked. Um, and um, Georgia, I want to highlight one that actually kind of transitions nicely from this discussion of intersectionality. Um, and that was a question from the first day about where does sins and valids 10 principles of disability justice fit within Darn's work. Um, and I want to actually drop a link in the chat to that work now. Um, for people who are not familiar with this work, um, it's it's wonderful and um, very influential in the um, disability justice um, world. Um, and I want to highlight a few of their principles and, and talk about um, what DARN is doing and maybe what we can do. So the very first principle is intersectionality. Um, and they frame it with a quote from Audre Lorde, uh, we do not live single issue lives. So ableism coupled with white supremacy, supported by capitalism, underscored by heteropatriarchy, has rendered the vast majority of the world, quote, invalid. You know, so I think um, as part of DARN, we are uh, very aware of um, kind of how disability is often treated as this um, singular issue um, rather than looking at intersectionality and we look forward to more conversations like the one we just had. Um, Georgia, I wonder if you have any thoughts to add on that point. Yeah, so for me, when I when I read the comments, I was very happy that that was brought up into the discussion um, because I think it's important to to address to address how how important is the work that Darn is doing, but at the same time how uh, it it created and it is formed from people who are working in academia, and how exclusive academia is. So direct outcome many times is like the vast majority, and probably it is visible also like from the form of the conference, vast majority, we are white folks, or like we are folks who are, might be disabled and not have other marginalized identities or might have more privileged oriented um, experiences uh, that uh, has been our support to be within academia despite uh, our, our disability uh in a system that is actually a list uh so the first thing is that, that i would like to address and i think it's important to to start discussions and put me also like uh in questioning how we could be more collaborative with non-academic organizations and collectives such as Sins Invalid who are doing amazing work and they are the ones who brought the term disability justice and what we mean by disability justice um, and how we actually can recognize our privileges as academics first of all and our personal identities secondly and um, I think we tried to bring that up during the conference at the same time. I, I still recognize how marginalized communities were not represented within uh, within the conference uh, as much as we wanted maybe. But this is also something that I would like to connect with another question that was mentioned about uh, policies, if we change policies and laws, how if we believe that ableism will be something that will disappear. Um, and this is not the case. I mean, of course, we need policies and we need laws, but at the same time, we need grounded work and grounded activism close to our roots and close to our communities and especially giving space to the most marginalized um, folks within our disability communities and neurodivergent communities um, on how um, 
on forming these laws and these policies and not just be a top-down process and progress, but a, be a bottom-up one. Um, and saying that, I'm, I'm still, I think that's an open question also for people who are attendees on ways in which DARN can contribute to these discussions and maybe find ways of collaborating with other collectives and organizations that maybe are more familiar with this kind of work. Um, I think I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but Kathleen, I would love your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, I echo everything you said, Georgia. Um, we really welcome, um, you know, increased collaboration with other organizations so that we can continue to increase the intersectionality of our um, mm -hmm. of our programming and of our group. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of other uh, sins invalid point that I'd like to comment on as well. Um, so, so one is anti-capitalist politic. Um, and so it says, in an economy that sees land and humans as components of profit, we are anti-capitalist by nature of having non-conforming body lines. And um, this is something I see come up in conversation a lot in disability communities. Um, and I think especially when we talk about academics who are disabled, um, because there is such uh, a strong norm about productivity and always working, right? Um, and so it becomes productivity and work equate to your worth, equate to your, um, to your ability to get a job in our field, to be promoted, um, you know, and with, you know, with disability, we really need to, um, from our experiences, kind of question whether that is like a core value that we should ascribe to, right? Um, and, and we can highlight some other points that Sins Invalid brings up as kind of alternatives to this capitalist approach to um, value and to quality of life. Um, is there anything else you'd add to, you'd like to add there, Georgia? Mm, I think uh, I think you covered me on this one. I think the active uh, effort from our side to to talk about productivity and like how many spoons we have in order to be whatever productive means. And considering, for example, this conference, how some of us contributed less, some of us contributed more in specific uh, aspects of this conference in order to everyone not, not feeling that we didn't contribute at all or that we over contributed or that we had burnouts because of that. For example, some of us, like including me, I was working very weird hours uh, in order <laughs> uh, to make this happen as a student and also as a person who lives with chronic pain. Some hours are more functioning for me. And this, capitalistically speaking, doesn't work, but mm -hmm. at least it somehow worked during this conference. Yeah. Well, um, that leads me to um, another point that they make, which is about sustainability, which I think really is a, um, a much more um, appropriate way to think than to think about things from this like productivity capitalist approach. And so they say sustainability, um, we pace ourselves individually and collectively to be sustained long term. Our embodied experiences guide us toward ongoing justice and liberation. Um, and, you know, this is something that comes up a lot in the disability and chronic illness communities. Um, sometimes people refer to it as the amount of spoons that you have. Um, Georgia, you um, alluded to uh, having experiences of pain and knowing yourself and knowing kind of the timing that works for you. Um, and I think this is a great reminder that people with disabilities are experts on their own body minds um, and really listening to that and honoring that 
is um, so much more important than simply valuing productivity, um, because that means that we are able to um, be involved in our meaningful communities and the things that we care about over the long term and not burn out. Um, I don't know um, if, if you want us to move to any of the other values, um, Kathleen. I mean, I think we could we could talk for many of them, uh, yeah. but my thought would be like to focus also in other questions while at the same time recognizing that this this uh, or the, like Dorn is uh, a network that we're trying to build, so it is still under formation. And considering these values, sometimes the difficulty of putting them in within academia context becomes even more difficult on how to approach it and how to include every value that we might consider as important in our activist life, in our personal life, but not in academic life. Um, just more as a question, but I would love like people to to contribute to that. Um, and with that, I would like to move to a question that was provided by a student about uh, when I hear something uh, that is ableist within a class or when a, a faculty member expresses ableist opinions, what I'm doing. And I think we kind of responded to that yesterday, but I would like to, to focus more on that because I recognize some of us are students and the power dynamics are very great. And at the same time, we want to, to take a stand against that, which can be overwhelming and which can endanger our um, effectiveness within class and our success in our degree. Um, and it was mentioned uh, yesterday about finding allies and about maybe give the space to someone else to speak up instead of you being this person. Um, and that's a great advice for, some situations in other situations it might be better to be more like i have been in situations that i cannot shut up i will and i will not shut up. <laughs> so um this becomes tricky and it can be uh liberating but it can be harmful in some ways so sometimes we just take the risk after taking this risk and speaking up it would be good to have a support system. So working proactively, it would be good to have Darn, for example, or some colleagues who might not be disabled or who might be disabled or neurodivergent and just collectively speak about it afterwards and us receiving the care that we need and we deserve. Um, and also how um, an another technique that I, another trick that I found helpful is not responding on the spot, but preparing an email later and finding allies within within my cohort in order to prep the email. So I don't know for other cohorts, like we have like a chat and we had it also in the MA. So he just exchanged messages and I said like, oh, I found this very ably. So I'm just very upset and I want to prep an email about that. Does anyone else want to help me out with that? And this is how we actually created a community. And I learned mm -hmm. for other disabled students existing in my cohort, in my master's program. So that was that was a great opportunity for empowerment and activism at the same time. And finding also faculty members because disabled faculty members might be rare, but exist. <laughs> so finding even allies like Kathleen, for example, exactly. like. Um, might be a good way to navigate through a program that, of course, power dynamics are huge and we depend on faculty for them taking decisions on our, um, on our success. And I'll just add to that, Georgia, I think that's a beautiful response. And from the faculty perspective, I want to remind people about intersectionality, right? And about the multiple privileges and um, disadvantages we might have. Um, and so for faculty, if you are a position of relative power in your university, if you have tenure or if you have been promoted to full professor, those are times when um, you can really take one for the team and 
do this advocacy work and I'm not just talking about disabled um, faculty members because again I noted that sometimes it's you know it's on the backs of those few faculty members um, then also talking about the allies who have power in their um, relative positions yeah and continuing uh, from student perspective I see also Talia's comment Talia's comment right now um, and I connected with another question that came to our chat. If we have any student-oriented um, uh, club or something like that within DARN, uh, we don't have, but please, if you join us, you can take the initiative and create one. Um, talking from graduate student perspective, we don't have many much time and very many spoons to do initiatives. So... If undergrads, for example, are having more um, time and want to spend more time on that and focusing on that, that would be something great to do in DARN too. Like, even if we don't have it within our university, we can have it virtually with other disabled students that we exist outside, outside of our universities and our programs. And I want to, um, to add to that, Georgia, that there are some existing organizations that um, are doing good work that I want to highlight, and we would very much welcome um, collaboration, interaction. Um, the first one is DREAM, um, and that is um, an organization that uh, supports local um, university student uh, chapters of uh, disability clubs or kind of disability um, pride groups. Um, and uh, we have some recent experience with it at OSU. Um, we have a student-led and developed um, organization called uh, the Disabled Students Union, and we are members of DREAM now. Um, and also our uh, DARN's social media manager, one of them, Emily Doffing, um, also works for DREAM. So, um, you know, we are very happy to start elevating a bit more of their work with, um, with Emily's involvement. Um, and let's see, there's one. Oh, and um, Nicole Rosa, also a member of DARN, noted that she is a faculty advisor of the Disability um, Honor Society. And I have in my notes what that is called. I'll type it into the, okay, I have links that I'll type into the chat. Um, and then Georgia, um, what was the next question you wanted to focus on? Um, this is, I'm trying to navigate <laughs> within the draft that we have. Um, uh, I think we had, um, give me one moment, please. For um, everyone watching, we are overachievers and we have a very long notes list that we will not possibly be able to get to. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so another thing that came was, I, I will just read the question, how it was formed. I am a fellow psychologist and wondering what your thoughts are for helping people with disabilities integrate a disabled identity in psychotherapy. And I would like to connect this question with another question on how can we address issues of internalized ableism, particularly in self-help, self-advocacy among students in higher ed. And I am connecting this two because it reminded me uh, Dr. Der's keynote about the models uh, when he spoke on models yesterday. Um, yesterday, yes. <laughs> And um, he mentioned about respecting, uh, like taking something from every model. So I am not sure as a person if I can do that, but as a trainee therapist and clinician and as a student who advocates, what has helped me is to give space to the people who come to me to get consulted, for example, or who are exploring disability, their disability. Um, to give, their, to give them space to explore every model and to listen to the qualities that they have on every model based on their culture and based on how they have grown up and what they believe. So instead of saying, oh, we have to make people believe on the sociopolitical or the social model, um, 
we um, we can just give the space for them to explore where while we are studying for a specific model or like integration of other models and say this is where i'm standing but i'm giving you the space to tell me why you find for example medical model helpful in your own experience what is what is what what is something i am missing on the sociopolitical model and this is how we can grow as clinicians this is how we can support therapeutics and clients and patients and this is how we can also do peer support with each other like giving the space to explore the experience per se without putting the labels on the models directly just giving the space to listen up first yeah Kathleen I would love also your insight especially working for many years as a mentor <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, well, that was great, Georgia, and um, I'm really glad that you were able to bring in the clinical angle. Um, and so, you know, one of the main impetuses for developing DARN was um, was my own experience and the experience of um, several other people I knew in the field of social psychology who had disabilities, but um, really struggled to find um, role models and mentors who, um, who looked like the us or had our lived experience. Um, and it was a real struggle as a student to not have those things. And I really was not able to make those connections um, with the community um, until after I graduated. Um, so I, I just you know, want to say that that is kind of the goal behind the, um, the group that we have here. And we just invite everyone to continue asking your questions and giving your feedback so that we can make this the most successful and, um, and community that will provide as much mentorship as we can. Um, Kathleen, would you like to move forward to another question? Sure. And also for folks who are attending, if you have any other questions, please, you can add them to the Q&A or at the chat. I'm at the same time monitoring them. You know, I want to turn this, I have a question for you, Georgia. Um, okay. <laughs> I know Just keep the drive. Okay, cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, because both you and I have taught um, psychology classes that were specifically focused on disability. Um, so I teach a psychology of disability class and and you'll have to remind us of the title of yours. Um, but, you know, as has been foregrounded by other speakers, these classes are very rare in America. Um, and so I wanted to ask you kind of what were the challenges that you ran into when you were teaching that class? And maybe what were some of the, the things that were most helpful or any resources that you'd like to recommend? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, actually. So just for providing background, I was a teaching fellow at the BPADS program here at the New School in New York. And I had a class, I was teaching a class introduction to uh, disability and psychology. Uh, so it was for undergraduate students. It was my very first time having a full class uh, to create it, to develop it, and also teach it. Um, so apart from the first timers issues and boundaries happening, um, a big difficulty for me was to take a step back and give what I was exactly saying before, like giving the space for students to talk about their their ableist perceptions in order to unpack them and and in this way we can work on them. So that was a difficult thing for me as a disabled person at the same time, as a disabled woman to to navigate it. Uh because I couldn't say, oh, that's ableist. Like that's not that's not the way teaching works. It's a safe space for people to to express themselves and learn while we also provide the tools and the material for them to grow um, and for us to grow within this process. Um, so that was my biggest 
struggle, I believe. Um, and also the absence from administrative administration perspective, uh, the absence of guidelines around accessibility. It was something that I had to build. Uh, it was something that I talked a lot with their members <laughs> on how to navigate with that, how to make um, assignments accessible for every student, or at least as accessible as possible in giving um, the opportunity for students to give me feedback on that. So that was, I think, the second, the second, the second biggest struggle. Um, regarding resources, uh, the work of uh, Dr. Olkin um, has been incredible resource. <laughs> um, her book about teaching disability is a very good guide, even if I didn't follow it step by step, I used many exercises within the class and it was very enlightening, enlightful to see like how students reacted to these exercises and these assignments and many good discussions around our own perceptions of disability, of disability sparked because of these assignments. Um, then uh, we discussed a lot of, within teaching subgroup of DARN. We, we discussed a lot uh, with Liz Aftonwell too <laughs> um, about syllabus and how to develop the syllabus and make it as accessible as possible. Um, and then what I did is instead of having a, um, a book that was a specific academic book, I used uh, Alice Wong's Disability Visibility book as the main uh, resource for students. So we worked with personal stories uh, of disabled people and we navigated with them and then based on the experience and of what disabled people and activists said we built the academic knowledge too so that was that was a great help to navigate in this way thank you so much for sharing all about that georgia i really appreciate the um the approach to um foregrounding disabled people's experiences with these texts that are not necessarily academic, right? Um, and then kind of building the uh, academic understanding from that, from discussions around that. I think that very much speaks to our idea of kind of nothing about us without us in, in disability. And I just want to uh, speak out from the chat that Lisa Rubin says that she wants to add that students have told her that George's course was the most important, valuable, impactful of their college career. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but I'm also like curious, Kathleen, like so many years, how you're navigating with these classes and maybe your struggles as like an experienced faculty member. Yeah, I've been, I developed um, a course uh, that I call Psychology of Disability, um, and if I now could go back and change it, I would call it Psychology of Ableism, um, but it's in the books now, and that th those things are hard to change, but I developed that um, about 10 or 11 years ago, and I've been teaching it um, at least once a year ever since, and um, it really has been one of the most rewarding things to develop and teach because um, it it keeps me updated um, with all of the discourse around disability. I really try to actively follow um, disabled activists on TikTok, as was mentioned, and on Twitter, uh, RIP, um, and things like that. And and um, I get these wonderful students who share their own perspectives, who some of them already come, you know, with a, you know, with a disability, maybe with a disability identity, maybe clued into activism. And then others come in, um, you know, without that perspective, but and perhaps without that language, but are really able to um, enrich the conversation with their own experiences. Um, so, you know, I think that um, one of the bigger challenges that I've had with this class is um, 
really encouraging students that this class is for them, um, right? So there's still this idea, this stereotype that disability is rare, especially among young people who are typically our students. But of course, this conference tells us that is not the case. Um, so I've occasionally gotten feedback, especially early on, that I needed to talk about things that were more relevant to students, more relevant to young people, right? And it's like, okay, but 19% of our population has this minority status. It, it is relevant to you. Um, and I think part of it is that I've just gotten better at um, articulating that over time. I think it's so important that we just like, have have the language, have the story, as Rhoda Olkin would say, um, to be able to express like why disability is relevant to you. And it's frustrating that we still have to do this, but we do. Um, and I think, um, you know, from our excellent talk on sensation and perception and how you might convince a department about why a class that includes disability is important, I think that actually provides us some good resources, right? We still have to be in that basic advocacy role of, you know, listen to us and include us, unfortunately. Yeah, and what comes to my mind is about, like, classes that are related to marginalized communities and are part of psychology curriculum many times are not considered real psychology classes um and this debate about what is real psychology and what is not real psychology and also uh, restrictions uh within program and curriculum for example i had the privilege to have two mentors dr rubin and dr farvid who gave me like the freedom of exploring how to navigate with class but not every instructor has that might some people might say oh the the curriculum of this class has to be very strict with an exam which is not accessible by the way most of the exams are not accessible to disabled and neurodivergent students mm -hmm. so finding ways of navigating within this system might be very difficult. And I think this is where networking comes comes up as a support and peer support actually on how to navigate with these difficulties. Um, and speaking of difficulties, we received at some point a question. Um, uh, let me find it, I'm sorry. Um, and it says, um, have any DORN members worked from a lived experience of emotional distress or mental illness? And I want just, the, the reply is yes. We usually do not talk much about it. <laughs> um, and we should, but I want to acknowledge and give some space for the stigma that exists on psychologists experiencing mental illness um, or being mad and about the sanism within psychology programs that many times we focus on ableism and we don't talk about the sanism that we have within our programs, uh, clinical or not. And um, thank you for saying that, Georgia, and I agree. Um, and I wanna point people who may be interested in um, learning more and perhaps just, you know, feeling validated by by the fact that um, we do exist in this community and that there is an intense stigma. Um, I want to point them to uh, Sarah Victor and Andrew Devendorf's research. So these are both uh, clinical psychologists and students who um, have lived experience with mental health conditions um, and they have published research around the stigma that is so very prevalent in the field um, and the stigma around doing so-called self-relevant research. So researching um, individuals uh, or the identity that you share. Um, and we have plans in the future um, to have a, a collaborative panel um, with Sarah Victor and Andrew Devendorf. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, reaching to the end, I would like to just like I would like to give the opportunity to whoever uh, cannot type or doesn't prefer to type questions to raise their hand so we can include them for a vocal 
presenting of their question or questions. I don't, I don't see anything, but if I see a, the raise hand is at the bottom of the screen, just let everyone know, just in case. Yeah. We have someone. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Ileana Gerardo Rivera. I I have an invisible disability and I'm I feel I'm safe with this, but I have a psychiatric disability. And I feel really especially about the research. I would love to do more on that, but it is really more as um stigmatized in the mm -hmm. psychology or mental health profession in Puerto Rico and, and more and even worse in the general population. And like, how do I, and uh, in where I living, how do I manage or what is your recommendation, recommendation to navigate, to do advocacy and also help my community and to promote that not only because you have a psychiatric disability doesn't uh, impose, you cannot do anything. You can be anything that you want. What is your recommendation? Thank you so much for the question. Kathleen, would you like to to go first? Or? Sure. Um, Eliana, it's great to chat with you again. I'm so glad that that you've been part of the conference. Um, yes, this is such a hard question. Um, you know, thinking about community, you know, finding whatever community you can, um, both in DARN, and I, and I think you're doing a great job of that, Eliana, because I know you've been um, recently found us and have been in a lot of meetings, but I also wonder if there are people in your local community um, who have, you know, a shared culture with you who could support you. Um, and and also to look for allies, right, who have more power um, because you're a student um, who could support you. Um, I also wonder if there are existing advocacy organizations that you could um, that you could partner with, right? Um, so those are my initial thoughts. What, what about you, Georgia? Um, I am thinking. Uh, I'm coming from Greece, where uh, some of the <laughs> values are quite similar around mental health within psychology community and mental health professionals. Um, finding community can be quite difficult because we don't talk about it and we don't speak up um, if we have an experience like that. Um, however, it might help to find people who might have similar experience, though they are not within mental health professionals or academics that can support. Uh, an organization that comes to my mind is the Hearing Voice Hearing Voices International organization. Uh, it's more a collective that exists in, the, in many countries, including Greece. And um, it's actually a collaboration of people who are hearing voices, professionals or not. And they are actually doing community work, which is bottom up, which is grounded. It's outside of academia, but they are doing an amazing job on supporting the communities because academia, at least in Greece, because academia is not open <laughs> enough to include an amazing work like that. So that would be something that I would look out for. Maybe more activistic oriented organizations instead of academic ones. So you can find uh, peers and uh, resources that will empower you in order to form and formulate in the future uh, an academic um, an academic speak. Uh, can I say it correctly? Yeah, an, a, a, an academic... Um, how do we say that? <laughs> Sorry, my English just disappeared. Um, yeah, to actually provide academic work on that, but maybe it should be started 
from the roots and the community instead of start searching in academia first. Yeah. I see also some recommendations in the chat. And I saw uh, a comment or a question about if we will include these comments somewhere with the recordings. And I'm not sure I can respond to that right now, but maybe we can share the document that we had with Kathleen that includes at least the questions that we included there that might be helpful. Yeah, so looking at that question, let's see. see will it be saved and shared? So, um, yes, as a reminder, um, we will share the video recordings and the ASL recordings um, for this event. The transcript will also be shared. Um, I, thinking about the chat comments, I, I, I don't want to promise something yet because I am sensitive to the fact that people may have written things in the chat that they might not want shared out in the world. Um, so I, I think we need to go back and talk as a as a group and darn about whether we want to do that. But certainly we'll share things like links um, and resources, and then we'll share those anonymously. Well, what do you say we answer another question? Um, looks like we have time to maybe do one more. Yeah. Um, would you like to choose one or do you want me to? Well, um, I see one uh, that I think would be nice to end on, and that's, um, it's, is it necessary to change national policies and social inclusion to reduce the impact of ableism? Um, and my very quick answer to that would be yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a much more nuanced answer, which is, um, you know, that that takes a lot of time and a lot of advocacy to get to that point. Um, I was especially like excited and energized by Dr. Ruth Olkin's um, presentation today when she was talking about what it takes to start a revolution. Um, and, you know, we're building several of those steps that she alluded to. Um, and, you know, we just need to ignite it to, you know, really move forward in, um, in getting policy work done. And of course, uh, you know, there are some really important things that need to happen. Like we need better representation in um, policy work uh, that include people with disabilities and multiple minorities. Um, you know, we could see that both at the like psychology level um, for some of the things that Dr. Olkin was mentioning, for example, at APA. And we also need, we need to see that um, in our state, local and federal governments. Um, but I think there are a lot of things that can be done at the grassroots level too, that we have a lot of power there. So um, Georgia, do you have anything to add? Um, I think um, I mentioned it somewhere before, but like in continuation to that, just at the same time, being aware of our own privileges and how space we create, we co-create with, with folks within our communities who have, who are less privileged and who have more struggle, who experience more struggles and just give this extra space as a community of Justice that was mentioned by Dr. Olkin. This is what, what reminds me also, like to do it within our spaces too. Yeah. Excellent. Um, that is all the time we have to answer questions. Um, this has truly been a wonderful experience and um, so glad that we had the uh, engagement that we did and we realized that there are probably people listening right now either live or on a video recording um, who may not have seen some of the other parts of the conference um, so we encourage you to go back um, look at those recordings when they're ready um, and take your time in working through the ones that um, may resonate for you 
Um, so thank you everyone for being here and stay tuned. We will process these videos and be sure that the captions are as clear as possible and we will get those up as soon as we can. I wanna thank the, uh, the entire DARN community for supporting us and especially for the conference committee for organizing this event and putting it together so fluidly. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Shivers gets uh, an, a special shout out because um, she has really been, um, yes, she has really been kind of the the person behind the scenes doing a lot of the hard labor of organizing, keeping us organized and, and is honestly much better at multitasking, I think, than I am. <laughs> so that is, I'm, I'm taking note of this. Um, so thank you all. And of course, thanks to our sponsors, um, the Society for the Teaching of Psychology and the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. And with that, we say goodbye and we will see you next time. Thank you.